The seventh generation technically started in 2005 with the arrival of the Xbox 360. However, that early in the console generation, there was little that differentiated next-gen from high-end titles. Barring improved shadows and draw distances, as well as a 720p output, it was hard at the time to see what all the fuss was about. And then in 2006, Sony launched the PlayStation 3. Priced at $599, it was clear that Sony was looking to sell a premium product, something that drew a line in the sand between earlier consoles like the PlayStation 2 and what was to come. From a hardware perspective, what is the most fascinating about the PlayStation 3 is the way in which Sony felt confident to experiment with what was, at the time, exotic components, such as the 8-core cell processor co-developed by Toshiba and the XD RAM that we would never see again in a major device. In many ways, the PS3 was resolutely a console of its time, but one only has to look at incredible technical feats like The Last of Us to realize that Sony's expensive, experimental console had tremendous lasting power. The cell processor at its core offered up an unprecedented level of power to console developers, encouraging them to shift GPU workloads onto the supercomputing-ready cell SPUs. And the 256 megabytes of 3.2 gigahertz XD RAM delivered raw bandwidth that just wasn't available on the Xbox 360. Nevertheless, throughout the PlayStation 3's lifespan, multi-platform titles consistently looked worse and ran slower on Sony's hardware compared to the Xbox 360. In some cases, the PlayStation 3 iteration was so unrefined that it actually hindered the gameplay experience. A complicated console architecture with definite strengths, but also major drawbacks, is the main reason why PlayStation 3 exclusives managed to look so great, even as multi-platform titles, by and large, crashed and burned. So why did Sony make these decisions, and what were the end results? Well, let's take a deep dive to find out. The Cell Processor – The Opposite of GPGPU Talking about the cell processor in this day and age is interesting because of the ubiquity of GPGPU, General Purpose GPU Computing. Because both 8th generation consoles paired extremely weak processors with reasonably powerful GPUs, developers spent much of this generation trying to find ways to shunt workloads off the CPU and over to the GPU. As a result, we've seen a whole host of systems, from physics to particle effects to hair rendering, operating on GPUs and not on the overtaxed Jaguar CPUs. Ironically, Sony's hardware design team decided to take exactly the opposite approach with the PlayStation 3 over a decade ago. The cell processor at the heart of the PlayStation 3 wasn't designed with gaming in mind. As a matter of fact, Sony wasn't even in the picture when work on cell started. Toshiba and IBM worked on Cell as a solution to handle complex physics and scientific workloads as well as rendering, albeit oriented towards CAD use cases. It's interesting to note here that while Cell was under development, the multi-core paradigm was in its most nascent stages. During the early 2000s, discussions, and even Intel's own estimates, indicated that single-core processors would continue to dominate, running at greatly increased clock speeds. People believed that the successors to the Pentium 4 would run as high as 10 GHz. In this environment, Cell was a remarkably forward-facing multi-core design, integrating multiple SPEs, synergistic processing units, working in tandem with the main PPE, PowerPC processing element. At certain tasks, the Cell processor was drastically faster than single and dual-core designs of the day. Rumor has it, during the initial design phase, Sony didn't even feel the need to integrate a discrete GPU unit because of their belief that the PlayStation 3's multi-core cell architecture could handle graphics workloads with ease. The RSX Reality Synthesizer GPU, based on the NVIDIA G71 platform, was something of a last-minute addition. Despite this, first-party developers like Naughty Dog made extensive use of the cell CPU to push the graphics bar forward. To understand exactly what made Cell so special, and hard to work with, it makes sense to take a look at its inner workings. The PS3's Cell processor is nominally an 8 plus 1 core design, with one high-performance PPE connected to 8 SPEs, which have a less flexible feature set but have the potential to deliver incredible performance if properly utilized. This CPU configuration presented major challenges in early years because few games were built with multi-cores in mind. While the PlayStation 3 did offer relatively high single-threaded performance with its PPE, developers who left the SPEs out of the picture left a lot of performance on the table. 
the Xbox 360's triple core Xenon design was slightly more conventional and easier to work with. Optimization invariably takes time, and that costs money. As a result, many AAA developers found putting out inferior PlayStation 3 multi-platform games to be an acceptable trade-off. The PlayStation 3's unusual CPU design was aggravated by what was widely described as a difficult SDK. Sony themselves owned up to this in 2009, claiming that they didn't provide an easy-to-program console because they wanted developers to iteratively leverage more and more of the PlayStation 3's resources over time. Whether or not this was a genuine answer, late-gen titles like The Last of Us do indeed offer visuals that are nearly a generation beyond PlayStation 3 launch titles. The PlayStation 3's memory design also proved to be controversial. The split setup with 256 megabytes of VRAM and 256 megabytes of system RAM resulted, at times, in titles that had inferior texture quality compared to the Xbox 360 or a lower frame buffer resolution. Sony's memory philosophy here was fundamentally different from Microsoft's. The 256 megabytes of VRAM utilized wasn't your run-of-the-mill DDR3. Rather, it was an exotic, high-performance XDRAM. The PlayStation 3 is almost the only major commercial deployment of that particular RAM variant. The 256 megabytes of XD RAM video memory buffer was clocked at 3.2 GHz, offering over four times the bandwidth of the Xbox 360's memory allocation. This meant superior performance, as long as the frame buffer fit within that relatively small amount of video memory. The trade-off is obvious. When video memory or system memory isn't quite enough to handle assets, performance will plummet, or optimizations will have to be made, usually to the detriment of image quality. Conclusion The PlayStation 3, in many ways, offered developers the exact opposite of the Xbox 360 in hardware terms. A weak GPU paired with a powerful CPU, and a split memory architecture with less flexibility but more performant VRAM. While Sony's decisions to make the PS3 tough to code for might have been motivated by a desire for longevity, the ultimate consequences are known. Despite costing more than the Xbox 360, and despite launching a year later, the PlayStation 3 by and large ran multi-platform games worse than Microsoft's console. The saving grace, though, was the hard work of first-party studios, who wrestled with Sony's tool sets to craft iconic titles like Killzone 3 and The Last of Us. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.